Hello, I'm Faisal Pervez, a South Asia analyst at Stratfor, and this podcast is brought to you by Stratfor Worldview, the world's leading geopolitical intelligence platform. Individual, team, and enterprise memberships are available at worldview.stratfor.com slash subscribe. I think war is oftentimes an experience where by its nature you can be very, very proud of it and also at the same time have huge regret all wrapped into the same memories. Welcome to the Strat 4 Podcast. I'm Ryan Bull. Today we're talking about a memoir that delves into contemporary geopolitics in the Middle East. Elliot Ackerman was a Marine, serving five tours of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan. They were not easy tours. They were bloody and deadly. For his part leading Marines in the Second Battle of Fallujah, he received a Silver Star. He also received the Bronze Star and a Purple Heart. Elliot Ackerman left fighting behind to begin writing. His work has appeared in the New York Times Magazine and The Atlantic. He has published Waiting for Eden, Dark at the Crossing, that was a finalist for the National Book Award, and Green on Blue. For places and names on war, revolution, and returning, Elliot Ackerman returned to the places where he fought. Elliot joins me now in the Stratfor studio. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ryan. You decided to return to a lot of the places where you have a, a military history, and you know, Iraq figures prominently in that. So it took you to these ongoing wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as Syria. And what brought you back to those places? Well, a lot of things. I mean, first of all, you know, the wars didn't end. So just because we declared that the Iraq war was over in 2011, obviously uh, it, it continued. And so as I was now making my way in the world as a journalist, it seemed like a very natural fit to go back to these portions of the world that had already you know, so defined me and to see where that story was going, whether it was in Iraq or, or in southern Turkey with regards to the Syrian revolution. So I think there was just that intellectual interest. But then obviously for me, because I had so many experiences there, you know, it cut deeper and there was also a real emotional interest and desire to go back. Mm -hmm. And you were retreading a lot of your old tracks in those places, especially in Iraq. Uh, how was the experience different from being a Marine versus being a journalist covering the, the post-United States experience there? Well, one thing that's a little bit different is I think sometimes people assume that it's more dangerous to be a Marine. But uh, you know, in many ways, it's kind of at times a little bit more unsettling to be a journalist. You know, when you're a Marine, it's sort of like going through the worst neighborhood in the city, but you're with you know one of one of two really tough gangs in town. And when you're a journalist, you know, you're like the guy who drives his Mercedes into the wrong neighborhood and is like asking around for, for directions out of it. So um, so in that respect, it was different. Um, you know, then obviously the nature of the work you're doing is different. I want to emphasize how dangerous it is for journalists, especially in places like Syria. And we kind of cut, touch on that in your book about how many of the people who've gone out there haven't come back as a matter of uh, just getting caught up in the wrong place may have disappeared because of uh, deliberate targeting, because of deliberate politics. Sure. Yeah, I think well, one of the things that's interesting just with regards to the state of journalism right now, you know, I'll talk to younger writers and, uh, you know, what I'll often say to them is it's sort of it's it's the best of times and the worst of times. It's a golden age in journalism because you can show up to uh, a Syria, a Turkey, a Ukraine, and because so many newspapers, magazines no longer have international bureaus. If you're a stringer, they'll, they'll publish you um, just because you're there. Um, it's also sort of one of the worst times because it's very difficult to have sustainable journalist, journalistic uh, positions. And I was looking into your background and some of uh, the people you've worked alongside or, or worked in the same area. It's interesting. There's a large group of veterans, a large group of, of researchers and journalists who have ended up kind of following this path of, of being part of those freelancing journalists out there. And we rely a lot on, the, on their expertise for on the ground details to do our work. Do you feel like you're you're part of like a cohort of people who have ended up going back to the region? Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't surprise you know, it's sort of a smallish community and very quickly you realize that everybody knows everybody else, whether they're journalists or researchers, and you will find yourself bumping into the same people in, in different places. And uh, it's not necessarily surprising because I think there is, in some respects, you know, a portion of this generation that has been made in the wars and the wars have been defining for them. And so why are we surprised that they keep going back and that's where they've found the work that gives them meaning? So I certainly saw that amongst writers, photographers, researchers that uh, 
that you would see all around the peripheries of these conflicts. And and speaking of meaning, your your book often has kind of allusions to the idea of, of idealism dented, shattered, lost, uh, the idea of regret. Um, I'm particularly struck by the, the words of uh, the democratic activist from Syria, Abed, who says, uh, sometimes I regret my revolution. Yeah, and one of the things that was sort of surprising from, not surprising, but uh, I didn't antis- always anticipate finding and then did find, was that among, like, for Abed, you know, who was a democratic activist early on in the Syrian revolution, uh, that he and I had kind of experienced these very similar emotional arcs, one of going and applying yourself to a task, to a mission that was filled with very high-minded ideals, to see that mission kind of run off the tracks, and then to be kind of reckoning with what it means to have committed yourself to those ideals, to still believe in those ideals, but to also be reckoning with the fallout and all of the destruction. So I would often have experiences with Abed or, Abed or other people like him who'd been activists, and they would, you know, over the course of a meal say, you, know, you don't understand, Elliot, like the, the revolution, we can still win, the Free Syrian Army's holding ground, and then by the end of it say, you know, I regret the whole thing. I think war is oftentimes an experience where by its nature you can be very, very proud of it and also at the same time have huge regret all, all wrapped into the into the same memories. Yeah, it's interesting, the dichotomy of like pride and regret. Like the, there's a lot within American recent political history, the, uh, the 2003 war is seen with that kind of a mixture of mostly regret when it comes to politics. I'm wondering whether or not you see your wartime experience in Iraq as something that ended up producing we see an Iraqi democracy that sort of functions. It's a little bit more nationalistic than it used to be. It's a little more functional than it certainly was even five years ago. And George W. Bush at the time argued, you know, give me 50 years, I'm going to look a lot better than I do in 2007. How do you feel about that with seeing the, the conditions of Iraq after the Islamic State's territorial defeat as we see a prime minister finally change hands peacefully, not under emergency conditions? Yeah, I think that... Um there's two things. There's my my personal wartime experience and how I feel about that. And then there's the policy and how the policies have worked. And so for me, I, I they're completely isolated from one another, if that makes sense. I mean, you asked me about my wartime experience. Emotionally, you know, I can think back. If, if you were to ask me, like, Elliot, like, what are, the, what are the 10 best days of your life? You know, I'd probably hold up like seven or eight fingers and they would be days that I was in combat. Um, uh, and the days I'm the most proud of. And you would say, like, Elliot, what are, like, the 10 worst days of your life? And I'd hold up seven or eight fingers, and I'd say, it's these days that I was in combat. And they're the exact same days. So that's the complexity I feel about the particulars of my wartime experience. You know, then there's the policy questions. And, you know, and the policy questions, I mean, you know, we can sit down and parse those, you know, that – I believed in 2002 and 2003 as I was going to the war that, you know, this is really seems like an enterprise that's fraught with a lot of risk and we're making some really big assumptions that if they are wrong, uh, we're going to pay a very, very hefty price. Um, you know, wh- I remember asking in 2003, well, what if there's an insurgency? Um, and many people asking those questions and it seems that the administration hadn't, I mean, we know had no plan for that and was just kind of making this hedge that we would be greeted by liber- as liberators. And then, you know, you can go to 2011 and the calculation that was to pull all U.S. troops out of Iraq. And this, again, another gamble uh, that I think you can only look at in the frame of the upcoming 2012 presidential election and promises that were made to end the war. Um, and we obviously saw that that led to the rise of the Islamic State and them seizing you know, vast swaths of territory in, uh, inside of Iraq and having Syria really as a, as a operating base. So there's all these things. So, you know, I think we are seeing a transition now. I think we have seen the decline of the Islamic State. I think there are indicators that are concerning, um, you know, I believe pulling all the U.S. troops out of Syria and pulling back in that part of the world could lead us to a position that's very similar to what we saw post-2011. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll have to see. I mean, one thing, sadly, uh, as Americans, we, we definitely seem as though we like to not only learn the same lesson twice, but pay for the same real estate twice. You know, as you look back at your your time out there, and you were drawn back into that place, and as you write about um, Austin Tice, a, a, you know, a fellow Marine, um, a Texan who ended up going out to Syria as a freelance journalist, and uh, whose whereabouts are currently are unknown, uh, strongly suspicious that uh, the Syrian government is holding him, and you write that uh, one of the things that may have driven him there was something that you call it, and you describe that as an experience so large that you shrink to insignificance in its presence. Do you think that that's 
what what brought you back out there was to experience those sort of things again. Uh, is that is that a major draw for you as you go forward? Oh yeah, I I think that. Um you know, when you again, when you would meet meet people, and I'm and I'm thinking of many friends of mine who are journalists, researchers, who whomever, who for the last fifteen odd years, their whole raison d'être has been to be involved in these wars, to write about them, to research them, to photograph them, and you know, if you're really sitting down and all talking, and honestly, I mean, there there are the political side. There's the political side of it, the policy side of it, and, and you talk about that, and we've just spoken about that, but then you know, you go deeper. You're like, you know, why why are you still here? Why do you keep coming back? Why are you not, you know, covering some domestic story? And, you know, it's this idea of wanting to be, you know, someone says it to me in the, bo- in the book. There's an anecdote where a friend of mine, you know, I say, why are you here? He's like, you know, to be close to it. I'm like, well, what's it? What is it? And I do. I think it's one of these experiences that is so large where you feel like you are standing at the epicenter of the universe next to the biggest thing that is happening at that moment. Um, and I can certainly empathize with wanting to be close to the it, whatever it is. Do you ever think you'll find yourself getting tired of, of that kind of uh, experience? Or is that something that you think is a, kind of a permanent feature of your, of your life now? I think it was it was with me before I even went to the wars. You know, I, I joined the Marine Corps because I think I had this abstract idea that I wanted to participate in the events that would define the time in which I lived. And uh, I, I happened to find that in the Marine Corps and the work that I do as a journalist, I still want to witness and write about the events that are defining the time in which we live. And um, speaking of definitions, you also write, um, you kind of see yourself as, as a Marine as something like experiencing an expat experience. It's something that I did myself. I spent about five years in the Persian Gulf. Uh, and what I found resonating with me is you wrote, I am defined by a place I might return to uh, someday. I found that very compelling because it, it hints at the idea that home is a flexible term. It's soluble. It breaks down over time, and it can become replaced by something else. Um, and you mentioned you have a, you have a family. You you move around. Um, do you find the idea of of having these experiences having reshaped the idea of how home works for you? Or? Yes, certainly. Um, you know, one of the through lines in this book is that. Um, is a series of conversations I have with a guy named Abu Hussar, who's a former member of Al Qaeda, and that's something the two of us kind of talk about a little bit. Is this idea that we are kind of from the same place, in so much as the experience that we really feel defined us is a shared one, even though we were on opposite sides of that experience. So this idea of kind of being an expatriate, this idea that you know you are forever defined by a place that you're. You know where you're not living, where you're not you're not present at that place, and it's not necessarily a geographic place. Um, it can also be an experiential place where you're sort of again we talk about the it. You're trying to go back to that place to get back to that place that that feels like home. Mm-hmm. And that that definitely leads me onto some. I found Abu Haddad's conversations with you fascinating. Uh, the the notion that you guys were close to one another on the opposite sides of the conflict and. Uh, one of the things I found very interesting, especially in our age of, of the rise of populism, is he writes, faith and strength in our ideology is everything. And I, I think I found him the, the one person who you wrote about whose belief in what he was doing remained most steadfast. Um, even at the end, he's talking about Dabik, and one day we will go to Dabik, and maybe we'll meet each other there. Maybe we'll be on the same side. Maybe we won't. Yeah, well, I think sometimes, like, for instance, with Abu Hassar, um, we're blind to the ideologies that we're bringing to the table. I mean, I probably have, you know, my own my own set of ideological truths that I don't think are particularly outrageous, so I don't view them as ideological truths that I'm necessarily imposing on someone, but somebody with a completely opposite set of ideological truths, like Abu Hassar, who believes in a radical strain of Islam with apocalyptic visions in the end of days battle, uh, Dabik, and, and all of that, you know, he look, probably views me as equally as ideological as I view him, you know, when I'm talking about, well, you know, we should have democratic institutions and people should be free to live the life, you know, he probably rolls his eyes at me as much as I'm rolling my eyes at him. But he and I were able to kind of meet in a common space to talk about uh, our wartime experience. And I think there was a curiosity we had with one another because because we'd both been defined by this experience. And when you're fighting, it's, you know, you're sort of involved in this in this dance with your adversary. And it's sort of, it's a shadow dance in that you can't see your partner, um, but you know that they're there because you know how they're acting upon you and how they're moving you around just as you're moving them around. And so when I first met Abu Hassar and we, we agreed to sit down, um, it was based on this sort of this gamble that he would be as interested in me as I was in him. 
do you see a, a future for his ideology? Do you think after the defeat of Islamic State's territory, driving back underground, do you think we've turned a corner? Or do you think that this is just another phase of, of what many have seen as a, as a generational experience for, for both sides? Um, I don't know exactly what the future necessarily is for the very specific ideology of the Islamic State. I think much of that will probably depend upon you know, the policies that you know, not only the United States but other nations adopt toward the Islamic State. But I think there's certainly a future for uh, radical Islam and just – Radi- you know, radical religious beliefs across the world. I mean, it's not just Islam where we see this. So uh, I, I'm, sh- I'm sure that radicalism is going to continue to play a very large role in geopolitics going forward. I'm Fred Burton. If your business or interests include operations in the Middle East, Stratfor's Worldview Enterprise provides individualized information to businesses and professionals who need to know how emerging events will affect them, their employees, and their businesses. With customizable maps, charts, and graphs of the political, economic, or security landscape of the countries where you do business, Worldview Enterprise is an essential tool for business planning. You can learn more about individual team and enterprise subscriptions at stratfor.com slash subscribe. Let's get back to Ryan Boll and Elliot Ackerman, author of Places and Names, on war, revolution, and returning. You wrote about the Americans' relationship with the Kurds, and you spent a lot of time with the Kurds, mm-hmm. especially in your coverage of Syria and Iraq, and the, the Peshmerga were on the front lines of defeating Islamic State in 2014 and 15, 16. Um, and you write, the Kurds have no friends but the mountains. And you add, possibly, the Americans. But now we've seen Trump try to pull out of Syria, kind of walk away from doing that. What do you see about the, the future of that that relationship between the Americans and the Kurds. I think it's very dangerous for us to turn our back on our allies and assume that there will be no consequences. To you know, to make the assumption that just because the Kurds don't represent a body politic that is as powerful or as populous as the Turks, for instance, that that isn't going to come around and be a huge strategic miscalculation for us. And, you know, and we've but we've seen that, and we've seen our inability to really be. Uh, forward-looking with how we treat our allies. You know, I'm thinking specifically of, you know, the the post-U.S. involvement with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, which led to the Taliban in the 1990s, which led to you know 9/11 and the whole morass we've been in for the last 20 years. Um, you know, you could make an argument that some of that could have been avoided with a more modest investment in the early 1990s in Afghanistan. So to sit here right now and turn our back on the Kurds who by all accounts, have been staunch allies in the fight against ISIS for something that for a more politically expedient arrangement with the Turks that's somewhat more nearsighted, you know, could wind up being a long-term strategic mistake. I can't sit here and tell you exactly how that is going to play out, but I feel like, you know, once you put that ball in play and we betray the Kurds, that ball is going to keep bouncing. They're not going to forget. Um, and I would, I would wager that in the next 10, 15, 20 years, um, it could, there could be a bitter bill that we're waiting to swallow. Oh, the Kurds represent a very interesting geopolitical conundrum within the Middle East. Like you said, they, they don't have a state, um, and they extend across four different countries, uh, two of which are still American allies. So bringing, uh, supporting the Kurds in a lot of ways also supports the idea of eventually potentially redrawing borders of both adversaries and allies. And that, that mm-hmm. puts a lot of people who are observers into that historical shock mode of, oh my God, is this Sykes-Picot all over again? That had its own century-long consequences. Do you think that there's a, a reconciliation between the, the mistakes of the past where the imperial powers just drew the map as they saw fit and the aspirations of uh, the Kurds who, who want pieces of territory that do belong to American allies? I think it's interesting. I mean, I think the Kurds are not a monolithic group. So the, you know, the Syrian Kurds versus the Iranian Kurds versus the Turkish Kurds and the Iraqi Kurds. And, you know, and they have, there are many, many Kurdish factions too. So, um, so I think it's dangerous to look at them as just one monolith who all want the exact same thing. I mean, there's certain Kurdish groups that are very leery of a Kurdish nation state because they, you know, they they can see with with clear eyes the challenges um, that exist in that. So I think, for, at least for U.S. policymakers, the the challenge is to actually be studied up and to understand some of the history behind the Kurds, but to also understand how our nominal allies. I'm speaking, you know, specifically of the Turks. How they use the Kurds. The Kurds are very, very useful to the Turks. Um, I was living in Turkey when um, 
Erdogan lost his first election in uh, almost a decade, and he was unable to form a majority governing body. And one of the reasons it happened was because it was at the time when he was discussing all these constitutional reforms, which would have given him an executive presidency, which he now has. And many Turks, in order to block him from doing that, said, we're going to go vote for the Kurdish party, the HDP. And so they went out and they voted for the HDP, and he was unable to get the votes he needed. And uh, he responded by throwing Selahattin Demirtas in prison, where he still sits. And he responded by bombing the Kurds in the southeast. There were a number of very questionable terrorist attacks that summer around Turkey that were blamed on the Kurds. And lo and behold, when a second election was held in the fall, most Turks weren't so enthusiastic about voting for the HDP and Erdogan's uh, AK party was able to get the governing majority and the Kurds proved pretty useful uh, for the Turks at that point. I only bring that up just because it's, you know, that's something that wasn't on a lot of pol U.S. policymakers' radar, at least I felt, seeing how they were speaking. Uh, and so it's important to understand, too, that this isn't just, you know, the antagonism between the Kurds and various regimes in the region. Yes, there's the antagonism, but the Kurds can also be that antagonism can be very, very useful uh, for, for the players in the region as well. And, we're, and that's one of those things that's playing into the uh, the Istanbul uh, rerun is is them trying to chase the idea of Kurdish votes to try to win a very narrow election in which they lost by only a few thousand votes in mm -hmm. March. They're trying to rerun and they're trying to find votes and, and convince these Kurdish voters to switch back to them. So it's, it's an interesting nuance of, of seeing how these different Kurdish populations and ideologies can be played both by states within the region and by the United States. But it's it does cover that that I, bigger idea of regional disorder. Of we have a lot of states with borders that many people accuse of being artificial. And Islamic State said that they very symbolically smashed up the border, uh, the, the sand beams between Syria and Iraq as they tried to erase what they called Sykes-Picot. Do you see this regional disorder ever coming to something like a, a, a solution or an equilibrium? Or are we going to be continuing to watch a lot of back and forth for, for the foreseeable I, I future? I think for the foreseeable future, we're going to see a lot of back and forth because there are many, many competing visions of what that realignment should look like. But I think what we're certainly witnessing is a existential crisis in the Middle East and particularly in the sort of trans-Levant area. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see how it shakes out. I think that a mistake we as Americans often make, and it's a, like a classically American thing to do, is we sort of assume that we are the indispensable actor and that if we can only figure out the magical bit of policy alchemy, we can deliver a solution that will cause the most harmonious alignment in the region. And the one thing I've always felt working there and that is – being on the ground, I think, is a real stark relief. Is you know, we are not the central actors here. I mean, the people who live there are the central actors. We are an ancillary, we're an important actor, but we are an ancillary actor, as are, you know, as are the Russians, uh, or if you're in Syria, as are the Iranians. So um, to believe that this is all on us is is misguided, and frankly, can be sometimes counterproductive. Well, and that, that kind of leads me to my next question of we watched within the Arab Spring the aspirations of, of democratic activists, Arab liberals, to try to change the systems that they live in. And in Syria is perhaps one of the, the most extreme examples of how that went wrong. With those recent examples and with we now have instability in Algeria in which the country is going through a political transition, we have serious instability in Sudan as well. Some people call this the, the second part of the Arab Spring. Um, what do you see about the, the the future of Arab democracy, of liberalism, of the ideals of the Arab Spring? Do you think those are in 1848 kind of experience where they're they're dead for a generation or a century, or, or do you feel like those can still come back in, in different places? Well, it's difficult to say because I think it's tough to look at all many examples in the Arab Spring where those ideals are manifested in, in ways that have been long-term positive. Um, and I think you've also seen a lot of that energy has been hijacked by other darker forces, um, and that's led us to the point where we're at now. So I don't know if those, I think those ideas are sort of universal ideas that have you know, stood the test of time over centuries and will continue to resurface, you know, ideas like individual freedom and a more liberal world outlook. Um, I think it's difficult to say categorically that they're dead in the region. Uh, I think we're seeing a lot of struggles still around those ideals, but I don't think we're going to see a conclusion anytime soon.
a lot of folks will see a dichotomy between uh, the authoritarian regimes, people like Sisi, and then basically the Islamic State. That's that's a lot of the uh, the propaganda that we kind of we sift through here at Stratfor. A lot of regimes will claim that's your choice. There are no Arab liberals. There's no Arab Democrats right now. You can either back the the authoritarians or you give the keys to uh, the radicals. Do you think that the region works that way? Well, the radicals are also authoritarians, so it's sort of you know the authoritarians or the authoritarians. I, I think that when you have societies that are in a high high degree of instability, um, you, people are often are just will go for stability no matter what the cost. And I think that that is unfortunately what you're seeing in the Middle East because there does not exist right now enough stability to have any type of real democratic government flourish, or at least in a widespread way. You know, it's also a little bit of a false choice because it's been set up by those actors. You know, I remember one of the moments when I was covering the war in Syria that was sort of fascinating to watch was when Assad let all of the Islamists out of the prisons. Um, because you look far better if you're fighting radical Islamists than if you're fighting democratic activists. And so you know, there's a lot of real politic being set up right now to ensure that those are the only choices um, because most nation states would prefer to, prefer to support a, a Sisi over a, an Islamic state. Mm-hmm. And that, uh, well, that leads me to a more specific question of, you know, the, the development of Iraq, the recent elections we saw were fascinating for us to observe, in part because we saw actors like Muqtada al-Sadr, who was a, you know, infamous insurgent who is an Iraqi nationalist on some days, and then he's Shia on another. It depends on his, his politics. But now he's a legitimate part of the Iraqi government with a legitimate uh, uh, support base. And we watch these coalition negotiations form a government that, at the very least, uh, produced compromises for the first time in Iraqi political history since the fall of Saddam. Um, do you see those sorts of events as, as part of a wider trend that will continue? Or do you think that the, the forces that have hijacked or sabotaged those uh, may get the upper hand back in Iraq? I think it depends. I just think it depends. I think that's on the Iraqi people and the, the Iraqi leaders, whether or not that type of compromise and functional government is going to be sustainable. But I think, listen, certainly today in 2019, things look a lot better than they looked in 2014 and 2015. We had a little bit of a war scare with Iran. Uh, we have high tensions with Iran since the president pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal last year. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the potential of a conflict erupting with the uh, with Iran. How do you feel about the the prospects of potentially another war happening? Yeah, I think I think one of the things that uh, is very troubling is that the you know it's become too easy for the United States to go to war, and we kind of have like a dysmorphic, I mean, we being the American people, a dysmorphic relationship with what war is. You know, war is something that happens over there. It only involves us if we want to volunteer and be in the military. Um, And we don't get taxed for it because we fund it through the deficit. So when a politician, Trump or whomever, starts rattling the sabers and we might go to a war with Iran or with North Korea, I don't think most Americans pay that much attention because usually we don't wind up going to war. And if we did, well, we've been to war before and, you know, it didn't affect me all that much. And I think that has sort of primed the pump historically for us to be in a really dangerous position of sleepwalking into a, a major war. Um, so a single, you know, a, th- a single miscalculation, we could find ourselves engaged in a war far worse than anything we've seen over the twenty year, the last twenty years. Um, so I think, you know, at this moment, America is kind of operating in a realm of real moral hazard with how it with its relationship to, to warfare and how our society engages with that. Uh, that's interesting, the, the notion of moral hazard. I'm, I'm not sure if you followed any of those congressional attempts to cut down the American support for Saudi Arabia and Yemen, and uh, they weren't able to get the supermajority to actually enact that legislation. And that's a considerable block, the imperial presidency being able to veto Congress's war-making powers. Uh, do you see anything like that changing anytime soon? Do you see the American body politic uh, demanding that that change? To me, it's less one. This is less a question of like specific foreign policy prescription. It's it's more one of you know how do we go to war? You know, like like you know should we have an all volunteer military still? You know, should we be allowed to fund wars this way? Um, you know, every war that we have fought in all the way, you know, all, all the way back to the beginning of time has been structured in a certain way from the Civil War, which is when we saw the first first draft, first income taxes to fund that war, to the mass mobilization of the Second World War and war bonds, to the very unpopular draft of the Vietnam War. Every war has had its construct. In these wars, their construct has been 
funded through deficit spending and fought by an all-volunteer military, which basically gives any president a blank check to rage, wage war for as long as they want. I mean, it's one of the things that's interesting is, is as divided as our politics is on all domestic issues, foreign policy still seems to be one of the issues, and war making in particular, where you know there's not a lot of daylight between between administrations. And we kind of have kept, kept these wars going from a Republican to a Democrat and now back to a Republican administration with no end in sight. And that, to me, is e- extremely dangerous. And I don't know how the cost of that is going to manifest, but I feel certain it will eventually. Uh, I'd like to ask you just one more question uh, specifically about the, the peace talks that are happening in Afghanistan and the, the progress that's being made there, having served in that conflict as well. It's America's longest war. Uh, how do you feel about the, the dynamics of that progress happening with the, with the adversaries, the Taliban? I think it's good. I think one of the great strategic mistakes of the Afghan war was right after 9-11, us immediately conflating the Taliban with al-Qaeda and, and really allowing that to go on for, I mean, almost a decade where the, you know, I think most Americans didn't know the difference between the two. Um, and we're in a concept that, you know, the Taliban are Afghan nationalists and that is what they have always been. Um, so if we can finally get to a point where we can see some, enough progress where we could end the war in Afghanistan, I think that would ultimately be a good thing for this country. Elliot Ackerman is the author of Places and Names on War, Revolution, and Returning. Thank you so much for coming in. Thanks a lot for having me. Thanks for joining us for this conversation with Stratfor's Ryan Boll and journalist and author Elliot Ackerman. If you're interested in learning how Stratfor can help you with analytical tools to visualize and anticipate those risks in the world where your interests and operations are at greatest risk, be sure to visit stratfor.com enterprise. Thanks for listening.